and uh, thank you uh, all for hosting us here today and giving ULA the opportunity to get up and talk to you a little bit about, about what we're doing. Um, let's see, if any of you looked at an earlier version of the program, you saw that uh, Tori Bruno, our COO, CEO, excuse me, uh, was originally going to present. Uh, if any of you have met Tori, you will not confuse me and Tori. I'll uh, make that very clear. Um, but Tori's uh, talk uh, was going to be about how we're using transformational leadership to reshape ULA. And so as, as Wayne mentioned, I'm a product development guy. So I'm going to talk about product development and really how we're introducing innovation into product development uh, to help reshape our company. So as Wayne said, uh, a great day uh, for the space program and a great day for our country with the successful launch of L55 just a few hours ago from the uh, west coast at Vandenberg on an Atlas Centaur vehicle um, in less than a week after our 100th mission. So when I was getting ready for this, this is my first time here at this conference, and I was talking to the folks. They really emphasized, um, you know, don't bring a lot of slides. And I think I may have overachieved in not bringing a lot of slides, we'll see. But also, everyone likes videos. So I went and talked to our uh, comm people, and they said, we have the video for you. And this was right after last week's launch. And so I looked at it, and it's 100 launches compressed into 60 seconds, all set to really loud, blaring music. And while it's cool, I just thought maybe at 9.40 in the morning, uh, after last night's activities, maybe that's not what you wanted to see. I do have some cool video later on talking about some of our product development. But if you get a chance to look at that video or any of those other videos, um, it's easy sometimes to not fully take in um, what's involved or what we're accomplishing. Um, that particular one, 100 videos of smoke and fire and rockets lifting off and flying over the horizon. But if you, uh, if you look a little bit beyond that, I'm trying to figure out how to change the slides here. There we go. Um, if you look a little bit beyond that, there's a great variety in, uh, in where all those spacecraft go and, uh, and what they do and uh, what they look like. And so this is a little summary of what those 100 launches comprised of. And you can see with our current Atlas and Delta product line, a very broad and uh, diverse product line of capabilities that we have, we've been able to launch a variety of spacecraft from small, to medium, to heavy lift, to a variety of Earth orbits, some very challenging Earth orbits, lifting some very large spacecraft directly, direct insertion, to geostationary orbit, and then interplanetary missions. The Atlas and Delta programs have sent spacecraft to all the planets in our solar system, and just over a decade ago, uh, set new horizons on its journey uh, to Pluto, all with 100% mission success. So this is where we've been, so where are we going? We certainly want to continue to serve uh, this diverse market with a broad range of capabilities, but we want to continue to offer new capabilities to our customer. That's really important in our product development roadmap, as well as to do it more competitively. So this chart is our product development roadmap for ULA. Some of you may have seen this earlier in this year at the Space Symposium. A couple points here. I think we feel it's very important to have a long-term vision, not just five or 10, but looking 20 years out. And while some of these steps here are very firm in our plans and we're currently working on them, like step one with development of the Vulcan booster, some are more speculative, and we realize that. I realize that if I come back here in three or five years to give this, what step three or step four, they may be a little bit different, and that's okay as technology develops, as our customers' needs develop, as new markets evolve, we will continue to evolve this product development roadmap. What we find important is that we do have that long-term vision and we're taking the steps now to make sure we're investing in the key technologies and capabilities to enable those new products as, as the markets develop. So a four-step strategy. So you're all familiar with the current rockets we currently fly in Atlas and Delta. What we're currently working on is we call step one, and that's Vulcan. That's the first evolution of Vulcan. The objective with Vulcan is to develop an all-new booster using an American-made propulsion system. We're doing this in partnership with Blue Origin, who will supply the BE-4 engine. 
It's an innovative engine that will use liquid natural gas as its fuel in an oxygen-rich stage combustion cycle. We'll talk some more about Vulcan and, and what it provides, but it will offer us the ability to serve that complete medium lift market that we currently do with Atlas and Delta with a single vehicle in a very affordable way. We will continue, right after the introduction of Vulcan though, we will continue to offer the three-body Delta IV Heavy for that heavy lift requirement. But before Vulcan ever flies, we're gonna get started on step two, and that's ASIS. And that's an upgrade to our upper stage. ASIS is our advanced, common, expendable stage. Not the greatest acronym. Maybe, maybe we'll have a naming contest for ASIS. Maybe not. Um, but ASIS really is a uh, game changer in two ways. First is a dramatic increase in performance. So uh, latest generation, next generation, uh, upper stage engines using LOX and hydrogen. ASIS will draw upon our experience on Centaur. Centaur is currently the most efficient, high energy upper stage in the business. And we're gonna leverage that experience and technology to make ASIS even more capable. And ASIS will allow us when coupled with the most uh, capable uh, Vulcan booster to fly the full range of missions from small to medium to heavy lift, all with a single family of vehicles, all with a single core vehicle, and allow us to retire Delta IV. So this is a tremendous enabler to us and to our business and to our customers and allowing us to serve that wide range of markets with a single vehicle and a very competitive product offering. But the other aspect of ASIS that is equally important and probably in many ways more exciting is what we're doing with the subsystems. It's just not a Centaur on steroids with more performance. We're gonna redesign and completely revolutionary the subs revolutionize the subsystems with ASIS. So right now we use a lot of different sources to get power on an upper stage. When I mean power, I mean all the energy we need to conduct that mission, whether that's batteries for electrical power, hydrogen for added control, compressed gas for repressurization of the tanks, and then finally, LOX and hydrogen on Centaur, if you will, for main propulsion. So with ASIS, we're gonna implement integrated vehicle fluids, and this uses, so all energy on the second stage is derived from that LOX and hydrogen that's already on board for the main propulsion system. So IVF, something we've been working with industry partners on for over five years and continue to mature that technology with an on-ramp for ASIS in the 2023 time period. IVF consists of two small internal combustion engines that run, over, run off ullage gas, waste gas, if you will, from boil off of our main propellants to provide power. These can turn compressors to provide a high pressure source of gaseous oxygen and gaseous hydrogen for a biprop attitude control system, and they can also repressurize our main propellant tanks for an unlimited, virtually unlimited number of restarts of that second stage engine. Coupled to these engines will be an electrical a generator to provide electrical power. So this enables us to take off a lot of other systems from the vehicle, reduce weight, simplify it, but more importantly, provide some significant capabilities. Right now, our most capable uh, Centaur or Delta IV second stage can stay on orbit about eight hours. And then we run out of juice in the batteries or we run out of pressurant or hydrazine. With IVF on ASIS, we foresee the ability to stay on orbit for weeks make plane changes, go to different places, a real diverse set of missions it enables. We're not even sure exactly all the different things that we could do with it, but we're quite confident that our customers in the industry, when they see what opportunity this provides, will uh, come up with a lot of great ideas for that. And it'll really be an enabler for further commercialization of space. Step three gets into reuse. Um, a lot of discussion in the launch vehicle, a lot of work launch vehicle business, a lot of work going on right now regarding reuse. And we think that is very important and will help enable us to be more competitive. Um, our view of reuse is called smart reuse. We'll show you a video of that coming up here. Um, smart reuse involves recovering the most valuable portions of the booster in a fairly straightforward way, a low cost way that also doesn't detract from the primary mission in terms of consuming performance or capability of that booster. Then finally, step four, and certainly this is the part of this product development roadmap that becomes more speculative. And like I said though, it's always important to have your vision on that long-term opportunity or state. Here in step four, 
we're going to look at these, uh, these very capable vehicle we have with Vulcan, with ASIS, with this one to two week loiter time on orbit, and look at new missions this will enable, like distributed lift. So right now, we always think about our missions with our expendable launch vehicles, at least, as having to occur in one flight. So with distributed lift, this enables Earth rendezvous in accomplishing missions through multiple lifts, whether that's assembling more complex spacecraft in low Earth orbit to then go on to conduct their mission, or setting up propellant depots that can be points of departure for interplanetary uh, expedition. Also in step four, we'll take another look at reuse, assess the state of the technology, assess how smart reuse has been doing for us, and see if it, what opportunities we have to increase the portion of the vehicle that we reuse, potentially working toward a completely reusable booster in second stage. And then the other aspect we're looking at very carefully is surface access. We have this really capable second stage that can do all these great things in orbit. Can we actually use it for surface access? So let's take a step back and give you a little more insight into Vulcan. Step one. So this shows us over the last 25 years how we've evolved Atlas and how that experience with continuous product innovation, incremental continuous product innovation has served us well. And while we believe that puts us on really good footing here to introduce this next step with the Vulcan booster. I could draw this diagram very similar with, with either Atlas or Delta being the starting point. Um, people often look at Atlas V and, and think it's old technology or not innovative. Um, people need to realize that Atlas started out as an intercontinental ballistic missile. I can assure you there's no parts in common with the current vehicle or the vehicle we flew this morning. So we continue to innovate incrementally and we will do this here with step one with the Vulcan booster and then the evolution of Vulcan with ASIS. Back in 2000, we uh, re-engined the Atlas vehicle with the RD-180 for an increase of performance. And then two years later with Atlas V, we stretched the tanks, developed a more capable booster, put, kept that RD-180 underneath it and rolled out Atlas V, and that served us very well. Vulcan will draw upon both our Atlas and Delta heritage. A significant amount of Atlas hardware, at least in the first step, will be reused with Centaur and our payload accommodations and some of our facilities at the launch site. But it'll be an all brand new booster. As I mentioned, LOX LNG is our primary option for main propulsion and working with our partners at Blue Origin, who are making great progress on development of that engine. And we're very excited about that. You can see um, the, the relative performance. Vulcan is intended in this first step to be an increase in performance over Atlas. So it's a very challenging task. Um, I'm the program manager of Vulcan in conjunction with my major development responsibilities. And we're looking to increase performance on board a new domestically produced engine and at the same time dramatically reduce our costs and improve our competitiveness. So it really increases the bang for buck that we can provide to our customers. You can see there with uh, within ASIS and Smart Reuse how we continue to evolve the performance uh, of the system. And the next chart here is just an expanded view of the, uh, of the Vulcan vehicle. Um, you can see the all-new booster. We'll use two BE-4 engines for main propulsion and up to six strap-on solid rocket motors. Those will be new motors being developed by Orbital ATK called the GEM 63 XL. And we're very excited about that partnership. Another strategic partnership that really enables us to provide a competitive product offering. And then you see Centaur in our fairings. Our fairings, um, both the 5.4 meter, 5 meter version that you saw earlier in the Sierra Nevada um, video as a, for encapsulating the Dream Chaser, um, both that, that fairing and a new composite four meter fairing will be provided by RUOG. RUOG is our other strategic partner on the program who will be providing all the composite structure and partnering with us at our facility uh, down in Decatur to provide those domestically. So that's a little overview of, um, of Vulcan, um, a little insight into our thinking about our long term 20 plus year product development roadmap and uh, appreciate getting the opportunity to share it with you. Um, wrapped up a little bit early here, but that's good because that's the part I enjoy the most, and that's a Q&A. So if you haven't already started with your questions, uh, please get them going here, and we will um, once again 
thank you for the opportunity, and I look forward to your questions. Thank you, Mark. We have a, we have a few questions here today. Uh, people need to get on their browser and start sending in questions, though. Let me just uh, start with this one. Um, uh, ULA has noted that You know, that Wayne, I just, uh, I just realized we forgot to show my video. You want to show your video? I'll sit down. They show want to the see video. the video. I knew things were going too fast. <laughs> so we'll go ahead and show the video. And this is on Smart Reuse. Uh, it's narrated, so I will add a few comments at the end. Um, before we get into it, it, well, we'll just let it go here. Phase of flight. After boost phase of flight, you turn off the main engines and then you separate your Centaur upper stage along with the payload. So at that time, the Centaur is on its own and um, taking the payload into the proper orbit. So after that's accomplished, then the booster is effectively complete with its mission. At that time, you can release the engines without having any impact to uh, mission reliability. And the long range business plan is to employ the reuse in about the 2024 time frame. So our concept uh, is using an inflatable decelerator, people refer to as HIAD, Hypersonic Inflatable Aerodynamic Decelerator. This is a technology that NASA has been developing to uh, be able to enter atmospheres for, for Mars, say, or for Earth. Let's think of it as a shield that, that uh, provides drag and is able to take the heat, so it has thermal protection. The next phase of the descent, if you will, for our application is to use a parafoil. And that technology is well advanced. People have demonstrated parafoils up to 40,000 pounds of mass. After the parafoil stage, there is the mid-air recovery. But our concept now is to use a helicopter to, to bring it back. When I first heard about it, it seemed, it seemed like a very strange, almost laughable concept until you actually start to look into the history of mid-flight capture and realize that it's actually uh, a very ingenious way to do it, to, to reuse and, and capture the engines without um, you know, exposing them to any sort of harsh environments like salt water. People have recovered objects coming back from space. They used to bring in uh, spy satellite films and capture them with an aircraft. So this has been done since the 1960s. It costs to recover. And some people have been looking at other technologies like uh, you could fly back your whole booster. Those propositions are very expensive. They have been thought of before. If you work the math, you see that you're carrying a lot of fuel to be able to bring the, uh, the booster back. And it takes much longer to realize any savings, if you will, in terms of the number of missions you, that you have to fly. And they need to be all successful. So where our focus is, on cost and the value of a proposition. So the main goal of Vulcan is to produce a, a high-performing, cost-effective, U.S.-made launch vehicle. That's the entire goal of Vulcan. And by uh, incorporating the reusability, that just further helps our goal in uh, making the vehicle more cost-effective by reusing the, the highest value components on the vehicle itself. So I just wanted to say the comment I wanted to make up front is, uh, is uh, pe some people like to poke ULA about not being innovative. You fly rockets that are derived from 50-year-old ICBMs. So we'd like to, we just took this opportunity to, to poke at uh, some of our competitors a little bit, but it's all in good fun. Um, I did get to give the, uh, the Blue Origin folks a heads up that we were going to poke at, at uh, booster reusability. Sorry, I didn't get a chance to reach out to the SpaceX folks. but. We do believe reusability in many forms is important. We all have a little bit different perspectives about what we think is the best way to go about that. And, um, but what's important is that we're all moving forward with different concepts.